Hi, everyone. Welcome to our monthly BCAC Youth Learning Series webinar. I will be your host, Alicia. Uh, we have a couple exciting topics that we will be discussing today and a fantastic uh, guest speaker joining us. We'll start off by talking about the pilot recruitment program that was launched this year by Cardinal Aviation. Due to recent industry events, for many that means helping them find employment by working to connect air operators with suitable candidates. We will go through the benefits of joining and how to sign up for the program if you're interested. Following that, we will segue into the importance of social networking and why building relationships in, within the industry is essential. And for those that missed our previous four webinars or would like to rewatch them, please visit the BCAC website under the resources tab and select the links. If you have um, any questions for Ryan, please submit them into the chat. Uh, we will take some time at the end to answer any of your questions. Um, it's crazy that we're nearing the end of our six part webinar series and next month will be our last one. With that being said, we'd uh, love to hear your feedback on which topics you enjoyed, uh, if you'd like us to continue hosting webinars and uh, anything that we can improve on. Uh, please leave a comment in the chat or email us at info at bcaviationcouncil.org if you'd like to give us some feedback. I know our uh, youth engagement committee would really, really appreciate it. And lastly, before we begin, a quick reminder that the webinar will be uh, recorded and to please turn off your mics. Thank you. So here with us today, we have Ryan Van Heren, who is the founder and CEO of Cardinal Aviation. Their primary goal is to enhance flight safety by encouraging ongoing learning for general aviation pilots and aircraft operators. The team at Cardinal Aviation specializes in taking those pilots and teaching them how to apply those skills in the real world in an effort to promote constant learning, improvement, and comfort in operating their aircraft. Cardinal Aviation creates a space for building relationships and networking. Ryan also sits on the board of directors for the BC General Aviation Association. You might have also heard him giving clearances on the radio as an air traffic controller or seen him flying around in a bear hawk in the skies. To say the least, he wears many hats in the industry and is a very active member in the community. So please welcome Ryan. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, there's some familiar faces here and uh, it's, it's really great to be here. Thank you, Alicia, for inviting me and uh, I really appreciate you guys all taking the time. And uh, hey, Olivia, good to see you. I talked to you the other day. It was fun. Um, yeah, so I want to talk to you guys about the flight crew or Cardinal Aviation, the flight crew.ca and uh, thing that we've started. Um, but primarily, I really want to talk about networking um, in aviation because especially now it's so important. So I'm going to just turn on screen sharing here um, and I'll show you my, show you this. How's that? Can everyone see that? Yeah, good. Somebody give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Good. So yeah, so we're going to talk about uh, pilot job placement and networking. So you see Cardinal Aviation and flightcrew.ca on there. And we'll talk about how the two are interlinked and why they both exist. So um, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, my history, uh, and kind of, I mean, I'm not the most qualified person necessarily to talk about every topic, but what kind of gives me the basis of where I'm coming from when we talk about this stuff. So my name is Ryan. Uh, I hold an airline transport license. Uh, in my flying career, uh, I did a bunch of flying in the prairies in Northern Canada on the uh, Navajo Twin Otter uh, wheel skis over overseas on floats there with the Twin Otter. Then I came back to Canada, uh, did some computer, computer, no commuter work. There was no computers in those airplanes. Uh, on the 1900s, uh, worked with Kelly uh, Jamison at that company. Uh, and then some medevac work on the King Air 350 and the Lear 31 and then flew corporate Challenger 601 for four years before um, transitioning over to Nav Canada, where I've probably talked to a bunch of you uh, with on Victoria Terminal. So uh, the whole story and why I ended up there is uh, there is no real good answer. Um, and I'm glad I did. It's been a really great experience um, and allowed me to really learn a lot more and get a much more well-rounded picture of aviation and the system and how it all works together. Um, after being at NAV Canada, once I finished training, I uh, found myself with a bunch of time on my hands, which uh, if you know anything about me, doesn't usually end well. So uh, BCGA kind of sprouted and uh, 
started as a Facebook group, became a registered nonprofit, and we've been working really closely and have an excellent relationship with BCAC uh, right from day one. So really thankful for that and the community that BCGA has kind of built around itself. Um, it's, it's great. We're now the second largest general aviation association in the country after COPA. And uh, we're all about, you know, working together with uh, the local flying clubs, with organizations like BCAC, with COPA, basically anyone it's, it's working together collaboration um, and just furthering flight safety and promoting aviation, which is something I know we are all very passionate about. And uh, again, all kind of links into this networking thing that we're gonna talk about. Um, I think Cardinal Aviation is uh, kind of a whole nother story kind of between my career flying experience and then oh, uh, being at NAV and then BCGA. Um, I don't know how to say this. I, I guess I kind of became fairly well known in the community. That was never my intention. I was just trying to build something that brings people together and gets people flying and promote safety and all that good stuff. But I'd have people coming to me saying, Hey, you know, like let's go flying. Maybe you can show me a few things. And so I was doing that just cause it's fun. And I like flying with people. Um, and at some point I said, you know what, I think there's, there's something here. Um, you know, not, not so much about money. It was more about providing a service. And if I'm going to do it, I want to do it from a, a credible organized source where we can deliver a constant product um, and, and quality. So Cardinal Aviation was formed and uh, the primary objective there was uh, coaching. So not necessarily doing ab initio training. Um, I am not a flight instructor, uh, but by virtue of my commercial or ATPL and certain experience requirements, I can teach multi, I can teach IFR, but really when I use the term coaching uh, versus instructing, it's about um, helping clients, helping licensed pilots um, kind of reach that next level of flying and find ways to uh, improve how they operate and really customizing it to their, op uh, their operation and finding uh, ways that work for them. It's almost like personal training, but for pilots uh, rather than flight instruction. So with that, and you know, opportunities go where they will. Um, you know, there came some opportunities to do some ferry flying, some consulting, uh, manage a couple of people's airplanes. It's just, you, you work hard and you try and um, build a reputation of doing things well and doing things right and really looking out for people first um, rather than a bottom line and, and opportunities kind of appear. And it's kind of grown on itself over the last two years. We started the podcast back in February. Um, and more than anything, I mean, it's just, been so rewarding to work with people to just help them get the most out of their flying. Um, it's been my side thing uh, for the last two years with NAV kind of being the primary thing um, coming up here. Uh, there's going to be a few changes to that and um, probably going to be doing a little bit more cardinal and you can read into that with what you will. But uh, yeah, I think there's really something here and just kind of rolling with it. Um, so in this whole thing about networking and job placement, um, I mean, we're all pilots. We all want to fly airplanes. Um, but in order to do that, sometimes we've got to do some other stuff. And I think it really comes down to diversification. Um, you know, learning how to fly an airplane gives us a certain skill set, you know, the ability to problem solve, uh, the ability to make decisions, to, you know, look at weather, no regs, you know, fly the machine. Um, but there's so many sub skill sets within flying that we can apply to other jobs and we can learn in other jobs that we can apply to flying. So um, throughout kind of my working life and knock on wood, you know, I've been working basically since the ninth grade uh, doing different things. These are some of the jobs that I've had um, in my journey and I'll just read through them. So my non-flying jobs, I, I worked in a warehouse, you know, packing boxes, uh, sweeping floors. I was, you know, I was young, like 13 years old doing that. Um, <laughs> I was a Christmas decoration and gardenware salesman. So I travel around to trade shows, um, setting up booths of Christmas decorations and all the crap that you buy in garden centers back before iPads and before electronics where people actually, you know, your grandmother would spend their her disposable income on, you know, something to put on her mantle. I used to call them dust collectors but that used to actually be a thing. Um, and that's what I would spend my summers doing. And because of that, I, uh, I'll put it there right now. I'm not a holidays person. I hate Christmas. I hate everything about it. I hate the whole month or the whole season. Like, let it be a day. That's my whole thing. 
I just, I, I duck and hide because for basically growing up, um, this is what I was surrounded by. So uh, it's like somebody who's got a, a clown issue because they had a bad experience with clowns. Uh, I've got a Christmas issue. So anyway, um, then also throughout high school, worked as a baggage handler at YVR, um, as a check-in agent, as an aircraft groomer, dispatcher. And then while I was uh, flying Northern rotations out of Calgary, I was uh, installing siding on houses on my days off. Uh, while I was flying medevac in Vancouver, I was doing construction, building decks, fences, odd jobs on houses. Also, while I was flying medevac on the jet, I was on my days off a limousine driver, driving back and forth to Whistler. Um, managed a restaurant uh, while I was flying corporate, and that kind of went well, linking the two. We took care of all the catering where at the restaurant that I was managing and put it on the jet. Um, and in the last couple of weeks, I've been a flower delivery driver because my wife just bought a floral business. And so when I'm not doing anything, I'm sent on delivery runs and I put on a bright orange sweater that says Franz Flowers bringing home a smile. And, um, you know, I know I'm a highly qualified aviation professional, but I am double parking in front of apartment buildings, also delivering flowers with a smile on my face. So all of these things in some strange way are interconnected and there's skills that we can learn in all of these different jobs and whatever your list is, um, is your list, but find skills in various jobs, whether you really like the job or not. And how can you apply it to your, to your flying journey? How can you apply it to how you network, how you deal with people, how you solve problems and vice versa? How can your flying, um, affect other jobs? You know, just the flower delivery thing alone. Um, I was given an address a few weeks ago and not only was it the wrong suite number, but it was the wrong building and using some of the analytical problem solving skills that we learn in aviation as a pilot or as a controller. Um, you know, it would have been very easy to say wrong address, wrong building, can't deliver, but I'm not going to say no to a challenge. And we managed to actually track down the person in a building like half a block away and get them their flowers. Right. I, I feel like in some weird way, my aviation experience gave me the tools to be able to um, proactively problem solve that situation and have a, have a good outcome, not give up, you know, like work the problem till the end. So those are my non-flying jobs. So talked about uh, what is Cardinal already. And uh, really for us, uh, it's about just finding needs and, and fulfilling them, helping solve problems. Um, and it's not just me. I mean, I've got a team of other industry professionals, uh, mostly uh, pilots, some that aren't commercial pilots, but have expertise in other areas. And, and they all work independently, but really it's a network of people that just really want to provide a really good service and further flight safety and make people's aviation uh, journeys uh, easier. And what I love, love, love about it is it doesn't matter what inquiry comes into us. Um, if I can't do it, I'm going to find somebody else who can. And that's the third point there. It's why are we successful? And it's because of networking, right? Over, over 20 years uh, that I've been in aviation now, I mean, I've built a network. We've all built a network, uh, whether you realize it or not. And it's kind of what you do with that network, which is what we're going to get into um, shortly here. And what I absolutely love is when somebody poses a problem or a challenge to me and I can say, you know what? Yeah, I, I can't do that, but I'm going to take care of this for you. And you know what? I may not make any money off. It's not about money for me. It's about the satisfaction of completing the mission of finding a solution to the, uh, to the problem. And, you know, just now, actually, while I was sitting here waiting for all of you while we were on hold with uh, Alicia, um, I just had a, a call and we're doing a ferry flight for somebody and I just found out we need an import um, document for the US. And you know, rather than go start reinventing the wheel and figure out how to do that, I've built a really good relationship with a guy named Mike in Calgary, who's an aircraft salesman. So I called him and said, hey, who do you use for, for, uh, for import documentation. And he gave me his contact and said, Hey, just tell that person that I sent you. And so we're constantly kind of like expanding that web and that network and helping each other out, um, because we're all kind of in this, in this together. So networking, um, truly is what has made Cardinal successful. Um, not, it's not that I know everything it's that I know and have built the network of who to go to, to find the answer to, um, solve the problem. So, that's kind of what Cardinal Aviation is. I absolutely love doing it. And uh, yeah, like I said, there's gonna be a lot more of it here coming up. So this is probably why most of you join this webinar and it's about flightcrew.ca and the pilot job thing. Um, sorry to disappoint you, there's only gonna be one slide on it. So <laughs> I really wanna actually focus on the networking thing because 
uh, dumping your resume on our website and I'll tell you how it all works is, is one thing, but it's really what you do with the time that you have uh, with potential employers, uh, with your contacts that is really going to make or break whether or not you find that job. It's not going to be which website you, you, you put your, your website on or, or what service you're using to do the work for you. You still really do have to do the work yourself. Um, so flightcrew.ca um, is, I'm, I'm going to go to the, to the second point first. So why does flightcrew.ca exist? So going back about 17 years, again, all about network and relationships and, and keeping in touch with people. Um, I was working for Air North uh, in Vancouver as a check-in agent, uh, just a baggage handler, all that stuff. And my boss at the time was dating this guy and this guy was a pilot for a BC company. And, you know, we all barbecue. Hey, nice to meet you. And you know what I do? I, I save that number in my phone. I save that name. I save that number. My, my contact list on my phone will make you probably throw up um, because I save everybody's name and number because you never know. And uh, we'll get into that shortly here. And so we kept in touch. We bump into each other at the airport and we talk and he offered me a job once. And, you know, I was at a training bond at a company and I had to say no, but we kept in touch. And um, probably about 12 years later, uh, we kind of cross paths again when a job comes in through Cardinal Aviation to do some consulting work for Transport Canada. And I knew what the the area of expertise that we needed to tackle for Transport Canada was right up um, Owen's alley. I knew he had uh, experience in it. I knew he was the right guy for the job. So I called Owen and we worked on that project together and, and it went really well. We worked well together. And then COVID, right? Here we are all sitting here in the middle of COVID and COVID sucks and 2020 sucks, but what can we do about it? So he had a job posting, um, come up and we were just been chatting for one of the airplanes that they manage. It was a Honda jet. And we're all sitting here in COVID going Honda jet. I'd love to jump in a Honda jet. Um, a year ago when the industry was short pilots and, and everybody, it was easy. Uh, he could have put out a Honda jet job posting and he might've got like one or two resumes, honestly, for it. Like the sad truth is that's what it was a year ago. Um, but with what's gone on with COVID and all this, he put up, a job ad for a Honda Jet FO position and had over 800 resumes. 800. To the point where it actually overflowed and blew up his email inbox and it stopped working. So we're sitting here one night talking and, you know, we had kind of tossed around this idea before, but it never really had any meat to it. Uh, and he goes, I don't even know where to start. I've got 800 resumes. I need one FO. And I've got resumes from like people 200 hours in a fresh commercial license. And I've got resumes from 15,000 hour Airbus 380 like pilots. So I don't, I don't even know where to start. And that's where flightcrew.ca came from. We're, we're sitting there talking, we go, well, how can we, how can we help? And it's, it's, it's as much about helping pilots as it is about helping operators. Because if you've ever been in a hiring position or been a chief pilot, um, you, you don't want to deal with 800 resumes. Um, if you, are a pilot, you want to make sure that, you know, your information gets through uh, to the right people. So what is flightcrew.ca? It's, it's really simple, actually. It's something we formed as kind of a, a sub part of Cardinal Aviation. And on the pilot side, what is it? Well, Owen and I talked and we talked to a couple of other chief pilots and we said, what are the key pieces of information that you really care about? So we created a forum where you all can put in that key information. Okay. And there's a psychological aspect to it during COVID. There's people have lost a lot of hope. They're not feeling super great. And even just for pilots to be able to put the resume somewhere makes them feel good. So even if nothing else, and we, we give you something to do with your resume where you feel like it is somewhere that could go somewhere, uh, that's, that's a booster and, and we're happy to provide that part. Um, but that's not why we're doing it, obviously. Uh, so the idea is to, uh, have pilots deposit their resume, fill out all the information, which allows us to sort that information and search through it. Okay. Um, an employer then comes to us and, you know, it's, we're still in the building phases of this and, and they say, Hey, we need to fill, you know, this position, that position. And we've done, we've placed well two full time so far, uh, which I think is a win, uh, as well as used it for some other work, which I'll talk about. And the employer basically says, these are my criteria these are my criteria that I need in a pilot. And we basically tell them, okay, well, how many 
potential applicants would you like? And they give us their criteria. And the nice thing is we're going purely on data. So we can strip out a lot of the stuff where there may be, um, you know, biases. So like we can strip out gender. Uh, we can, we can strip out, you know, uh, race, religion, whatever, any of, any of the things where you may think, okay, well, you know, people have these pre predisposed biases. We can strip that out because we go purely on the data and, and what they're looking for in terms of proximity, um, flight time, type of aircraft experience, even past work experience, like what kind of other jobs have they had? And we take their criteria and really try and select the best, let's say five or 10 that we feel would be the best fit. We'll also sometimes throw in one or two wild cards that might not meet all their criteria, but based on everything that we're seeing, we think would be a good fit because the underdog always deserves a chance as well. Um, once we have those, uh, we contact the pilots, the applicant, we say, hey, this is the position that has come up. We want to submit your info to the uh, HR person or the chief pilot. And once we get their approval, we go ahead and do that. And then we're pretty much out of it. Okay. So that is how it works. Uh, we talked about why it, ex uh, how it exists. Uh, the other thing that it's been really useful for, for Cardinal, um, is that, like I told you, there's jobs that come in that I can't necessarily do that our team, uh, that is existing can't necessarily do. Uh, but I've got this amazing database now of pilots from all over Canada that I can go to. And, you know, for example, I had to, there's a Cessna 182 that had to go from Toronto down to like North Carolina. And I mean, I'm in BC. I was able to go to the database and find four pilots in the Toronto area that could move that airplane. And quite frankly, when I, when I send work out to other people, I don't really make any money on it. But for me, it's more about pleasing the client, making sure uh, it gets done and making sure the pilots are well taken care of. And if I can go to that database when a job comes into Cardinal that, that we can't do as we are right now, and I can help put you know a couple of bucks in a pilot's pocket and put them to work and get them flying again, that is also a win. So that's actually what we've been doing more of, but we're still in the building phase of flightcrew.ca. And the more resumes that we can get in there of all experience levels, um, the better chance we can go to operators and have operators come to us uh, as a credible source for helping them not have their email uh, inbox blown up with 800 emails. So that is, um, that's the what, the why, and the how. And future plans for flight crew, um, for now, we're just trying to build up that database of pilots. We're trying to become a little bit more known with operators uh, and so that we can just help on both sides because we know once COVID is over or once, I mean, not over, but settles a little bit and the industry gets back to normal. There's going to be a lot of people getting back to work. There's going to be a lot of operators that are going to have increased demand. So really we're positioning ourselves and right now to be able to help you, the pilots and also help the operators, um, to really smooth the transition back. Um, and, and yeah, as far as other future plans, there's some other stuff going on that I can't say too much about right now. Um, but let's just say that dot CA, um, insinuates a Canadian thing and we're, we're going to try and, uh, go a little bit further than a forum that's on our website and with all the manual sorting, we're, we're going to try and, and take this, uh, and, and expand it, let's say, uh, outside of, outside of Canada in, in a really new way that is, uh, beyond just depositing a resume and, and waiting to see if, if it places with a job. So that's like crew.ca. There's no fee for pilots. Uh, quite frankly, there has been no fee so far for operators because right now for us, it's just about getting pilots back to work and back into airplanes. Um, it's a service that we're providing. Uh, so really get on there, uh, submit your stuff, keep it updated. And, um, and yeah, speaking of opportunities, um, one of our pilots and coaches, Blake, he's a laid off transat guy right now. Um, he's been helping us with flight crew and we, have seen a couple hundred resumes and um, there's no real set format for pilot resume, but there's some that are really, really good. And there's some that could use a lot of work in terms of formatting the right information, you know, stripping out a lot of uh, unnecessary information. So Blake has put together a, a program through Flight Crew as well, where we are providing a service to pilots to uh, clean up the resume, uh, format the cover letter. We won't change any uh, of the content of the cover letter though, because that's a deeply personal thing as well. And this is kind of exciting is an internet presence report because um, everyone's on online. And the first thing an employer is going to do is Google you. 
So uh, we could kind of do that in advance and, uh, and Blake will put together a report and we can kind of assess your online presence and how it's going to come across to an employer and maybe you can make a few tweaks to help yourself out, which brings us into the networking side of it. Um, are there any questions specifically on what I've talked about so far? Um, yeah, just give me one sec. I'll just go through the questions that we've got so far. Um, there is one here. Um, you have had many non-flying side jobs. What was your favorite side hustle so far? <laughs> I love the side hustle thing. Um, <laughs> hold on. Let me, my favorite, honestly, um, they're all different. I can tell you the one I, I liked the least was, was house siding installer. I didn't like that so much. Um, limousine driving was kind of fun because, and fun for a really strange way because everyone, you know, there's stereotypes, right? And people think, you know, taxi driver, limo driver, you know, uh, unskilled professional. And as, you know, uh, a, I was flying a medevac jet at the time, um, I'd be sitting there driving a limo back and forth from YVR to, to Whistler, from wherever to downtown. And I mean, I know I'm a highly trained professional. Um, that has a good job and I'm quite frankly driving limo. Yeah, to make a few extra bucks, but also because I don't like sitting around doing nothing. And I got to meet some really interesting people, but the most enjoyable part of limousine driving for me was when people didn't know my background, didn't know what I did when I wasn't driving limo and just treated me like absolute crap, right? And treated me like an unskilled, you know, person that has, you know, is capable of nothing else than driving. There's nothing wrong with driving full time. But just knowing um, who I was and sitting in front, you know, yes, sir, where would you like to go, sir? Oh, yeah, you want me to, oh, yeah, you just wait here. And they, you know, they just, they would treat me like absolute crap. And it gave me this just like snide kind of bit of satisfaction knowing that I'm, I'm better than they think I am. And it also changed a lot of how I treat other people in my day-to-day -day life, um, being on the receiving end of that. So kind of a weird answer to that question, but I, I did enjoy limo driving. Uh, one for the assholes and two because there were some actually some really cool fun people um because people typically get in the limo they want to have a good time so yeah pretty funny um another question here uh did you have your atp license when you were in that or when you were with nav canada yeah yeah i had my atpl for several years prior to about five six years before i went to nav canada so um yeah, so my my blue document is kind of like my proud little passport. So I've got my, uh, it's actually funny because I had a rec license first, like way back in the day. So no matter what licenses I've got since, I still have recreational pilot permit as, as a permanent fixture on one page, which makes me laugh. Um, and then I've got my airline transport, I've got my ATC license, uh, and I've been picking away at helicopter for the last couple of months. That's kind of slowing down here because I need to plan my finances a little bit better. But um, I'm doing it that for a couple different reasons. And one of them is just to have the trifecta of my fixed wing ATP, um, ATC and commercial heli, but that's going to be kind of a long-term thing that I pick away at. So yeah, I, had, I did have it first. Very cool. Um, another question here. Uh, what year did Cardinal Aviation start? Uh, <laughs> that's a funny story too. Cardinal Aviation started in 1987 when I was two years old. Uh, it's funny because the when I was when I went to Nav uh, qualified, I knew I still wanted to fly, and um, so I went and found a single engine Cessna to buy. Uh, price was right; it was local, and uh, the guy who owned it, it was you know he had set up a company for the sole purpose of owning the airplane, which was called Cardinal Aviation because it had a Cessna Cardinal. So rather than buying the airplane, I bought the company for the price of the airplane because then with it comes its only asset, the airplane, and you don't have to pay tax on that. So I bought Cardinal Aviation to get the airplane that it owned, sold that airplane. And then when I was gonna start actually doing Cardinal Aviation stuff, I already had this company on the shelf. So I just continued with it. But officially, like as a company that it was doing business um, two and a half years ago. Okay, really interesting to, to know. Um, <laughs> another question here is what is the long-term vision for flightcrew.ca? Um, like, are you gonna be open to expanding to other positions in aviation too? Like maybe let's say maintenance, stuff like that. Yes. 
<laughs> I, I can't say too much about what's coming, but flightcrew.ca um, right now primarily is about is about connecting pilots with jobs. Um, what we're working on moving forward um, will include other um, other areas of aviation, other jobs, be it you know flight attendant, uh, be it aircraft maintenance engineer be it uh, like certain management positions. But I think no matter where we go with it, I think the core, and I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the other people I'm working with right now, but in my, in my feeling, the core will always kind of be the flying side, but the other stuff will be there, yeah. Okay, we'll do one more question and then we'll move on to the networking side and then whatever remaining Q and A stuff we have, sure. we'll do yeah. it at the end. Um, so this question is uh, in the current COVID industry climate, what advice do you have for, for, for fresh CPLs and 250 hour pilots? Is instructor rating the safe and only play? Let's get through networking and then ask me that again. Gotcha. <laughs> Are we good? All right. I'm going to continue on with networking here. So I, um, to preface this a little bit, the industry for the last, okay, before COVID, let's say for the seven years prior, um, and I don't want to sound arrogant or condescending when I say this, but has been really, really easy. Um, anybody that's kind of been around since the early 2000s, I know Kelly's going to smile a little bit when I say this. Um, I think Carolyn was here. I think I saw her name. Uh, she She's really slogged her way through this as well. Um, we're kind of experiencing now what we experienced in the early 2000s, but on steroids, like it is definitely a different kind of worse now, but a lot of the principles that we had to fall back on when we started are now going to become important again. When for the last probably seven, eight years, this whole networking thing hasn't been so important. You've been able to get away with being kind of lazy about it because you get out of school, you have a license, there's a pilot shortage. Somebody's going to offer you a job. Um, you're probably not going to have to, I don't want to say work too hard for it, but you're not going to have to work too hard for it. Um, that has changed. So networking and everything I say here in this networking portion is from personal experience and from coming up the hard way um, in the industry. And that said, there's a lot of people that have had it a lot harder than I did. Um, I've kind of learned this from experience. And a lot of it is from making a lot of the mistakes that are mentioned in here. I've done some things not the right way and, and learned from them. And I want to pass them on to you so you can do it the right way. So what is networking? So I, I basically looked it up in the dictionary. So it's the action or process of interacting with others to exchange information and develop professional or social contacts. Okay. Why is it important in aviation? Because everybody knows everybody like there, especially in Canada, there's, I guarantee you not more than two degrees of separation between any two pilots in this country. Okay. And pilots by our very nature, uh, are very slow to praise and very quick to complain. And it's just how we are. Uh, there's really no way about it other than just being aware of it and trying to combat that. Um, but people are always quicker to talk smack than they are to say, yeah, that, that person's amazing. They think about the, the negative stuff. So um, networking is really important because in my flying, the flying side of my career, um, in, before ATC, not including Cardinal, um, there was one of my flying jobs that I ever actually interviewed for. The rest were all just from networking and referrals. And, um, you know, you see jobs go up advertised to be applied for. For every one job that you see advertised, there's, there's eight jobs that were filled um, that were never advertised just by somebody knew somebody knew somebody and somebody was in the right place at the right time. So keep that in mind when you're saying there's no jobs because you're not seeing any job postings. There are jobs. You're just not hearing about them because your network hasn't um, branched out perhaps far enough. Um, and the other thing is first impressions are lasting impressions. Like I can't say that enough. We all try not to be judgmental, but we are all judgmental as hell. And when we meet somebody, um, you've already decided what they are to you in the first 30 seconds. When I was driving a limousine, somebody got in the back of the limousine and in the first 30 seconds, you know, I was an, I was an uneducated limousine driver, right? Not a professional airline transport pilot, uh, you know, air ambulance driver that might have flown their, you know, injured aunt two days earlier to critical care. That's not how they looked at me. They looked at me as a limousine driver. So um, 
the first impressions are lasting impressions. We'll get into that in a little bit as well here. Okay, this is really, really important. Um, not to hound on the negative, but networking is not, and this just really, really important. It is not accosting strangers at a conference, airport, or an FBO, okay? I pulled these and, and changed them a little bit from the Open Learning University, so these aren't necessarily all my words, but networking is not accosting strangers at the airport, okay? It's not mechanically repeating a summary of your career to date, you know, uh, just being on autopilot, uh, I've done this, 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 hire me. Okay, there, I'm done networking. That's not what it is. It's not forcing a business card or a resume into people's hands. It's not asking people for favors. It's not bombarding them with emails. It's not ruthless self-promotion or adding someone on Facebook or Instagram. Like, yeah, we're in 2020, but because you've added somebody as a Facebook friend or you've liked something on Instagram or sent them a message, is it networking? Yeah, okay. It might be like scratching the surface of starting a conversation. Like you have to start somewhere, but just be very aware of how it comes across and don't think that doing any of these things means your job is done. Okay. Okay. Networking involves a couple other things, okay? And I want you to see if you can see a theme here. It's, it's thinking of what you can offer others. It's doing your research, reciprocity. It's asking the right questions, taking a genuine interest in others, uh, being generous with your time and attention, taking risks and going outside your comfort zone and following up on connections. And if you see a theme here, it's really, it's not about you, it's about the other person. Right. If, if you're making it about you and what, what can you get out of it? Um, you're not networking, uh, you're using people and, and networking is like communication. It's a two way thing. Um, so doing your research is, is important there because yeah, you know, you don't go into, if you're networking, you're looking for something sometimes, or sometimes you're just wanting to build your network because you know, one day you might have something to offer them or they might be able to help you out. Like it's, there's, there's always a, there's always a me goal in there. There's always a self-interest and that's okay to acknowledge that and to own that. Um, but it's a two-way street and you may not have something that you can offer them right now. Uh, something material it might not be financial. You might not be able to give them money. Um, they may, you may not be able or be in a position to give them a job. They might not need a job. Um, but you can give them, you know, not your contact list, but what value do you provide to them? Are you a, are you a good person? Do you make their life better in some way? Um, if they needed something at some point, do they feel that they could call you, even though you, you're looking for something from them eventually, do they look at you as somebody that they could call when they need some, something that you would drop everything to help them out? Is that, that's, that's reciprocity and doing your research is, is kind of knowing who's connected to who right? Know a little bit about the person. It's, it was a lot harder, you know, 15 years ago before Google and LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram, like most people you can find something out about now. You can find out what kind of, uh, you know, charities they're maybe involved in or something that something about their kids, not to be creepy or, you know, something that they're passionate about. And you can already kind of know what you're getting into. I mean, Owen, in one of the podcasts had a really good point. Anytime he's got a charter client on the, on the challenger jet, he knows who's going to be on board and he searches every single passenger and tries to find out at least one thing about them so that, you know, he may not be like, Hey, I heard you like uh, real Madrid soccer. No, but he knows that you can kind of manipulate and steer a conversation towards sports. You, you know, that they have a common interest or may something you guys can talk about. So that's, that's doing your research. Um, asking the right questions, you know, don't ask questions for the sake of asking questions. Think about the questions you're asking and think about how they may come across and maybe rephrase them um, in such a way where you are actually showing a genuine interest, that you actually uh, care about the answer, that you're not just asking a question to start a conversation. Uh, taking a genuine interest, I mean, that's self-explanatory. Uh, being generous with your time and attention. So um, this is really about kind of giving back to community, giving back to organizations. Uh, you know, I'll use Alicia as an example. Like, just in promoting this webinar, Alicia has gone out there and I mean, using the term CEO of Cardinal Aviation may have been going a couple steps too far. Um, I'm flattered, but yeah, not quite. Um, but the point is, is every single one of however many people are here now know Alicia busted her ass to get this webinar going. Okay. And spent a lot of time getting it going. And, and 
that's a volunteer position for her and everybody should know that. So what is she doing? She's being generous with her time and she's being generous with her attention to details. And when any one of you or I, something comes up that, you know, may need that skill set, we're going to thank Alicia, right? What Alicia did in setting up this webinar is networking, even if you don't think it is, you're getting, you're getting out there, you're getting your name out there, but not in a self-promotional way in a, I'm being generous with my time and attention to try and help the greater good. And in the long run, you know what? I'm building my network. Your network has just expanded by however many people are in this webinar. So that's what I mean by that. Okay. Um, taking, taking risks and going outside your comfort zone. You know, some people are introverted, some are extroverted. You know, it takes a lot to strike up a conversation with somebody. Um, the simplest networking example I can give you from my entire career was I worked at Air North for three years. And they said, it's been a great three years, but it's going to be another three years before you see the inside of an airplane. That was in 2005. And so I gave my notice and moved to Calgary with no job, no place to live, no plan. I just knew that's where flying jobs were. So I worked my last shift at YVR and I had my truck packed in the parking lot to move to Calgary. And I knew I wanted to eat something before I got on the road. So I went into the A&W at YVR in the domestic terminal there. And there was two jazz pilots in line in front of me, right? Kind of their half, their backs half turned to me, kind of half facing. I don't know. I, I'm a talker. I like striking up conversations with people. And so I, they, the one guy kind of looked at me and they were wearing their pass. And I mean, I'm an airline employee as well, kind of, even if I'm, you know, a check-in agent. And I asked a genuine question. I said, Hey, where are you guys based? That was it. That like, that was the entire, where are you guys based? Like I'm taking a genuine interest in where are you guys from? And this was what happened next. He turned around. He said, Calgary, have you ever been? And I said, actually, I'm moving there today. And then he looks at me, he goes, let me guess, looking for a flying job. I said, yes. And he goes, do you have a place to live? I said, no. And he said, I have a basement. Uh, you can have it for 350 bucks a month. You just got to look after my dog when I'm on the road. I said, excellent. He said, I'll see you tomorrow. And then I moved into his house the next day. Right. That happened in the a w lineup at the YVR terminal while I was grabbing a burger to hit the road to drive to Calgary. And I had a place to live the next day. What that like, that's networking genuine question. I have something to offer. turns out I can look after his dog when he's on the road. He's giving me a screaming deal on his basement suite because I'm also a, an aviator in the industry. He feels he can trust me. Um, that one exchange took exactly that long and probably was a turning point in my entire career. Right. So that was taking a risk. I was going outside my comfort zone a little bit and I reaped some benefits. Um, he never hooked me up with a flying job. It never really, but I met, that's how I ended up siding houses in Calgary. That's how I had a place to live. That's how I was able to do things and find work there because I had a place to live and a lifelong mentor to bounce ideas off of. That same person was diagnosed with leukemia last year and was in the hospital and he called me and he sounded like absolute shit. And I was driving home from work. I, I talked to him on the phone for about two minutes. And I, instead of driving home, I drove straight to YVR, bought a full fare airline ticket and went out to Calgary to go see him in the hospital because that is what, a, that is what building relationships is about, right? It's not about what can you give me? It's this, this becomes a, a lifelong networking relationship. He's recovered now, everything's good. There's a happy ending there, but that's the point. It's a, it's a, it's a give and take, okay? And then following up on connections, and this links over to kind of doing your research. Um, back when I was looking for my first flying job and it was not easy, um, we didn't have iPhones with like note, note scratch pads and all that. I kept a, like a black book with me and every place I went and every place I dropped off a resume and every place I, I talked to somebody, I'd, I'd write a name of the place and their name and the date. And if they mentioned something like, oh yeah, hey, thanks, da, da, da. And they said like, I got to take my kid to soccer practice today. I'm like, oh, Donna at such and such company, kid plays soccer. So when I go follow up that place a um, couple months later and Donna was at the desk, I'm like, oh, hey, how's your son doing at soccer? And she's like, what? I'm like, yeah, well, when I was here like four months ago, you were taking your kid to soccer practice. Like, how's soccer going? Guess what? They now remember you as somebody who, I, okay, on, do I really care about her son or that he plays soccer? I don't care. I really don't. But paying attention to those details, taking the time to note them down and then mentioning them next time, that is what is going to set you apart from the other 20 people that walked in the door. Networking. Okay. Networking tips. A couple other things. Get out of your house. Okay. Flightcrew.ca is great. We want to help you find a job, but the job does not 
like the the job search does not end when you when you send hit submit on a resume. Okay, you can apply online to all the jobs you want. Um, that's not networking. That's that's email blasting. Get out of your house. Doesn't mean you got to go hang out at the airport. Uh, get involved in like a local sports whatever if you can. I mean, COVID makes that difficult, but take take part in these webinars. Like, go for a minute and click through the names here and have a look at who's all here, who has a common interest to you, right? Get your name out there for doing the right things. Um, and that's part of joining groups, join communities. I mean, we've got BCGA, the Facebook group, like huge community of like 2000 people. And, you know, one of our members is an A380 captain from Emirates that has lost his job. And he's like, I want to go fly a little airplane. Can somebody take me flying? This was yesterday. He's got dozens of offers to go flying all over the province. He could probably fly for the next every day for the next three weeks. Right. Join groups, uh, take part in conversations, give useful feedback. Don't just complain. Um, get known as somebody who takes an interest in other people and takes the time to, to help, uh, build a reputation and social capital. So social capital is interesting. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily have money to throw at things, but I have time and I'm a busy person and I may not have a lot of time, but if I need to do something, I make the time. And, oh, there's, let's silence the old phone there. Oh, faux pas. Okay. Um, so build a reputation as somebody who is always ready to help others. Uh, who's going to drop what they're doing to help others, to volunteer their time, to try and make something better. Go to your flying club and help, you know, paint the clubhouse, you know, main room or whatever it may be, get creative and look for opportunities to meet people in the industry, outside of the industry, because everybody knows somebody. I was talking to somebody recently who lost their flying job and he goes, Hey, I'm thinking of, you know, going and driving an Uber. And I said, drive Uber. I said, but be smart about it. Put on an aviation kind of a tasteful aviation theme shirt and go hang out in Richmond, somewhere near the South side. And you go poach every single Uber trip that comes up from one of the FBOs with flight crews that have flown in and need a ride somewhere or, or aircraft owners that need to get somewhere you go park. And even if it's just, you get one or two trips a day from the South side of the airport, that's networking. You're being smart about it, right? You're putting yourself out there, connecting with the right people. Um, never passing out an opportunity, right? If somebody offers you to go do something, even if it's not something you don't, you, you don't really want to do, but if it's any, any way linked to aviation or linked to somebody who has a link to aviation, go do it. Um, I was the, the company that Kelly and I both worked together at. I, I did a short term four week contract on a Navajo and they said, you don't have enough time to fly the 1900s, go get a thousand hours and come back. And the airplane had to be, um, had to be repositioned back to its, its home base in Prince George. And they said, you don't need to come. That can be done single pilot. We don't need the low time FO to do it. And I said, but I want to come meet you. And they said, fine, you can come, but you are going to have to find your own way back to Calgary. And I said, sure. And when I was there, the general manager of the company invited me to his home for dinner with his family. And you don't say no to that. So I put on my best pants and my best shoes and a dress shirt. And I went to Bill's house for dinner. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so we had dinner and at that time it was, uh, man, it was like December, November, whatever. The ground wasn't totally frozen, but he was digging a pad at, behind his house for a hot tub. So we finished dinner and he put on his work boots and his coveralls and he started digging a pad for his hot tub. And I remember grabbing a shovel and just saying, screw my shoes, screw my pants, screw my shirt. I'm going to help this guy dig a hole for his hot tub. And I destroyed everything I was wearing because there was an opportunity to say, Hey, look, I don't care what I'm wearing. I can get my hands dirty. I'm going to work hard for you. Um, did it lead to a job there right away? No, he still said, you don't have enough time. Go away. Come back when you have more time, but just do what, do what you need to do. Okay. Um, take advantage of your advantage. So this is where I'm going to go like a little bit offside, maybe politically, but everybody has an advantage. Know what your advantage is and capitalize on it. Um, you know, there will be people that say, oh, well, you have an unfair advantage because, you know, you're a white guy or some companies, you have an unfair advantage because you're a woman or you have an unfair advantage because you're Aboriginal or because, because your dad worked at the company, whatever it is, take advantage of it. That's why it's there. This industry is too hard 
to not take advantage of your advantage. So know what your advantage is, be tasteful about it, be tactful about it, but take advantage of your advantage. There's no shame in that. Um, and anyone who has a problem with it, you know what, they also, everybody's got some advantage somewhere. They just need to know what it is and how to capitalize on it. And they just haven't figured theirs out yet. So know what yours is and, and use it. Um, set, make time and set priorities. Anybody who says they don't have time for this or don't have time for that, haven't made, ha haven't made the time. If it means that you got to get up at 4 a.m. instead of 6 a.m. to get what you need to get done, done, do it. Make what you're doing and what you, where you want to go priority in your life, okay? Be patient. You, you send an email, you send a resume, you meet somebody. This whole networking thing, it doesn't happen overnight. You can't take a genuine interest and ask the right question and expect to reap the benefits the next day or even the next week. These are relationships that take uh, weeks, months, years to develop, to build trust, to build reciprocity um, to where they are you know, useful. And some, some are faster than others, but be patient. Okay, do things that you don't love. I'm gonna be really quick on these because I know I'm dragging out and I, I apologize, but do things you don't love. Like I didn't love all those jobs, but I did them and I met some really interesting people doing them and I'm better for it. Um, there's a difference between persistence and being annoying. So there's a way to be persistent with a job or with an employer without being annoying. Find that balance. Okay. Get creative. Um, you can listen to the podcast episode on resumes about getting creative with resumes. Like we've done everything from putting them on bigger size paper to cardstock to, I mean, there's been some really weird things that we've done, but get creative. Uh, you know, if you're delivering Uber eats, do it with an aviation shirt on because maybe you end up delivering Chinese food to a chief pilot's house, get creative, uh, branch out. So get outside of aviation a little bit. Um, always be prepared, keep your promises and get your hands dirty. And I think I already talked about those. Um, the one thing that will hurt somebody faster than anything is if you come across like, I'm a pilot, what I do is fly airplanes, I don't do anything else. In an industry like that, that will be the number one thing that is the end of your road. So just be aware of that, okay? Um, questions to ask yourself. And I think this is the second to last slide. One, at just, at the end of this, and if you want to screenshot this, do it. I can, we can email it to you. Um, who, do you who do you know? Take an inventory of, of who you know, because you all know somebody. And then think, I mean, this is kind of like the be your own Facebook algorithm. Who does who I know know? Right? So who do I know? Who do they know? And then the next question is, what do you have to offer any of them? And then what advantages do you have? We talked about that. And if you met a new contact while you're out grocery shopping, how would you come across? I always think about that. You know, I could, I could be wearing a t-shirt with a big, big middle finger that says, you know, fuck you at the, at save on foods. Cause I think it's a fashion statement, but is that really the first impression that I want to leave with whoever I might meet? If I, if I meet, you know, any of you, what are you going to think of me? You know, I may think it's kind of funny at home or in my, you know, close knit group of friends, but if I'm at the grocery store, how am I going to come across and treat every time you leave the house as a potential contact, as a potential job interview for somewhere that you may end up in the future. Know what makes you different because low time pilots are all the same. They're all 200 hours. They all got a multi, they all got an IFR. 200 hours, it's all the same thing, but there's something about you that makes you unique. There's something about you that makes you different. And it may not be about job experience. It may not be about flight time. Um, it's just something about you, where, what you have to offer, the way you operate, the way you think, what you're willing to give, um, what makes you different. And the last question that you need to ask yourself is what baggage are you carrying and, and how can you deal with it? We all have baggage that is gonna affect our networking, our careers, our job search, and which is the last slide and it's, so you've made some mistakes or burned some bridges. Now what? And a couple of you guys know me here. I've burned a few bridges, but when I burn them, I destroy them. <laughs> okay. It's just, if you're going to burn a bridge, you don't do it halfway. You go all the way, but it will always come back to haunt you. And that's just the nature of this industry. And I have learned through destroying a couple bridges. Um, these are my, my tips. And I've given a few people that have, you know,
Um, I think we might have lost Ryan. Let's see if he can pop back in. Ryan, can you hear, uh, hear me? Okay, I think he's just trying to rejoin. Sorry about that. He's just about to wrap up too, and then we'll get to some questions. Um, I'll give him a couple more minutes. Hopefully he can rejoin. If not, then we'll, we'll have to wrap, wrap it up. I just want to be mindful of everybody's time. Hey guys, sorry about that. Hey, you're back. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that was that was the last slide. You guys read it all, but the the main part being just you know if if you've done something kind of in the past that didn't really go so well, just own it 100. percent Be explained to be prepared to explain like what you learned about it or from it and what you would do differently. Don't blame anyone else. Don't make the same mistake if they give you that second chance. And if there's somebody that you really want to work for or that you would want to work for, chances are they're going to respect your honesty and integrity and give you, give you that shot. Okay. So that's kind of my one-on-one on networking. That went a lot longer than I planned to. Uh, I apologize, but that's it. If there's any questions. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Um, just, yeah, I just want to say thanks for creating such a great new initiative with your flight crew. Um, .ca, um, side hustle, we'll call it. Um, I think, the work that you're doing is exactly what, you know, the aviation community needs right now. It's so important to have innovative leaders um, like yourself, especially through tough, tough times like these to help um, with people, you know, who really need it and might be feeling really overwhelmed with all the uncertainty. Um, so we'll take a couple questions quickly um, because there was some that came through uh, that we didn't get to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. So um, one is, how do you balance everything you're doing while raising a family? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't waste a minute of a day. So um, at Nav Canada, luckily, when we're at work, you know, we work for an hour and then we got, you know, 45 minute break. And then so I use all my break time where I probably should be resting and try and make it productive time doing stuff like, you know, getting ready for this BCGA, um, you know, the volunteer type stuff I do. Um, but the thing is, there's a lot of different hats I'm wearing, but they're all very interconnected and related. And none of them feel like work because it's all stuff that I love doing. So it's not like I'm balancing, you know, four jobs and family. I've really kind of, I got family, I got my day job and then I've basically got this this aviation whole thing that is for me a way of life okay and um, the kids go to bed and I work on this I should probably you know I could probably spend some more uh, time with my spouse I'm probably a little bit lacking there and and I'm aware of that and I try and do what I can but 
um, I, you know, I've got my, my work family, I've got my home family and I've got my aviation family and I'm, I try to balance them all. I, I could definitely do better, but it's really about when something needs to get done. Um, I just find the time, make the time. Like don't, I don't really watch any TV. I don't golf. I, I just do this. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, if, if I'm 10 minutes early for work, I sit in my car and I get a couple emails hammered off. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big user of lists. Like I use the reminders app in my phone. I got lists for everything. And if something comes across my mind, it goes on a list and, and I'm really just diligent about trying to get everything checked off. So a little bit OCD like that, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if that answers the question, but there's always time if, if you, if you know where to make it. Yeah, totally. Um, we'll go back to that other question um, that we, I mentioned earlier. Um, so in COVID, in the current COVID industry climate, what advice do you have for fresh CPLs slash 250 hour pilots? Is instructor rating the safe and only play? Okay, so I'm gonna sound probably like a bit of an ass in how I answer this. Um, if that is the question, you probably shouldn't be an instructor. And here's why. Um, we all have, and I may, I may, that may be too far, but here's, we've all done flight training at some point and we've all had a lot of different instructors and there's the instructors that are instructors because they want to instruct and because they're passionate about teaching and they're passionate about, uh, passing on information and knowledge and experience. And there's instructors that are, um, and I don't know who answered that question just so you know, because when I disappeared there, it cleared out the whole chat history. So it doesn't matter. Um, and there's instructors that are doing it because it's the play that's going to get them the thousand hours to get them the next job. And we have all had both of those types of instructors probably at one point or another. And we all know which one was really actually better to learn from because they were there for the student and not for their time. So that is why I never became an instructor because I knew early on that if I was an instructor, I really, I wasn't going to be there for the students. I was there to get my quick thousand hours so that I could one day get to an airline. That was, that was the end goal. Right. And it was all going to be about me, 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 me. And if it's about me, then it's not about the student and that's not fair to a student. So, um, is instructing the only option? No, it's not. Is it the safe option? Probably. But if you're going to instruct, I guess I would say, do it, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. You know, is it a good option? Absolutely. It's a good option. If you're doing it for the right reasons, um, for a fresh 200 hour CPL, you know, what should you do? Diversify, diversify your skill set. get out there, do things that might not involve a flying job or an airplane, because you never know who you're going to meet. Um, Kelly, your baby is amazing, by the way. Um, you know, I can't, I can't answer this question. He's staring at me. It's awkward. Um, you never know who you're going to meet, where those opportunities are going to lead you, what you can offer others. Um, so as a fresh 250 hour pilot right now is a really tough time. But like I said before, for every one job ad that's out there, there's eight others that were never advertised. So build out your network by getting involved in other things rather than sitting at home thinking about how hard it is to be a 250 hour pilot. That's kind of my answer. Gotcha. Okay. Um, this will be the last question. Um, I was just wondering how I can get into the industry on the business slash finance side of, of aviation with companies. Good question. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm more of an operational type person and everything I've done. Um, again, like I don't, I probably don't have the golden answer to this. So I'm going to just preface that right now. So I'm at this point just talking, but if, if I were to answer that question based on the limited side that I know about the business slash finance side, um, cause if I knew anything about finances, I never would have become a pilot. That's for sure. Um, easy answer it comes down to networking as well. And I would say, again, diversify your experience, find related industries that you can get experience in and then find ways to interconnect those with aviation because aviation is very um, narrow. It's very kind of one way of doing things, but there's things that, you know, we could learn from fast food. There's things that we can learn from the medical industry. There's things um, and processes that are in other industries that can make aviation um, better on the business side, on the HR side, on the accounting side, uh, operational best practices. Um, the more you know about 
different things outside of aviation, the more useful I think you are inside of aviation. And so get those experiences, um, network, 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 network it, like go back and look at the whole slideshow. Anything that applies to pilots there also applies to really any job in any industry. Like you could take aviation out of any line in anything I talked about today and drop in, uh, you know, dog walking. How do I build my dog walking clientele? Follow all the same, all the same steps. So yeah, unfortunately I don't have, um, probably the best answer for the finance side, business side. That said, I also, I did a business administration program, like university diploma program uh, as part of my aviation. Um, and I went to school for two years and I don't actually have the diploma because I had one final exam to write, which was an accounting final. And on the day of the accounting final, I was offered a job interview for a baggage handling job. And I knew I was more likely to get into a cockpit via baggage handling than by accounting. So I went to the baggage handling um, interview and long story short, I didn't get the baggage handling job. I also never got my university diploma. So I'm probably not the best person to ask about finance. I'll take one more if it's there. Um, the, la the last one was, um, there's one more here. What's the most important lesson you've learned from aviation? Um, it's not just you, it's a community. And everybody, has to look out for one another. Um, nobody can take on this industry by themselves. If you think you're the best and that you have it all figured out, you you're wrong. Um, that I've learned a lot. Um, another big one is, you know, the asses that you kick on the way up are going to be the ones you're gonna to have to kiss on the way down. It's going to happen. Like be careful how you treat absolutely everyone. Right? Like, that person who was the line person while you were flying your King Air um, that you were kind of snarky with and thought you were a little bit better than and kind of treated like crap, even if you didn't realize you were doing it, very quickly could be the chief pilot that you're interviewing with trying to get a job when you've been laid off because a horrible pandemic has you know, gripped the, the planet. So every person you meet is potentially part of your network. Every person you meet may need you at some point and you may need them at some point. And so just keep that in mind in every single, single interaction that you have is probably the biggest lesson I've learned is just the need that we're, you may be competing with people for a job um, or for an upgrade or for whatever, but at the end of the day, we all need each other in order for this whole system to work, so. Totally. That was some really good advice. And I definitely resonate with all the networking stuff that you had mentioned. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to say thank you again uh, to Ryan for joining us today and the viewers for tuning in and, and staying with us. Kind of, we've uh, kind of extended out past the hour. So thanks for standing by. Um, I hope you all enjoyed today's topic and I hope you guys can join us again in November for our final webinar in the learning series. I uh, just want to say again, thank you and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you guys for all being here. Thank you, Alicia, for all the work you put in. And um, yeah, I'm really humbled that you guys took an hour out of your day. So thank you so much.